my name's Georgia Elliott Smith. I am the managing director of a sustainability consultancy based in London called Element 4 and we work in the construction and the property sector. I'm an environmental engineer by background, so I'm very technical and I'm based in industry. But I'm also a, a legal activist and an environmental activist. Um, I'm currently taking the UK government to court over uh, carbon emissions and waste incineration. And I'm a former UNESCO Special Junior Envoy for Youth and Environment when I was younger. <laughs> so but I try to carry on that sentiment of, you know, speaking a lot to youth and trying to bring youth into our conversations and, and trying to inspire people around the world to take action. Um, why is that important to bring young people, women, um, like to empower young people and women to in the fight against climate change, in your opinion? Gosh, I mean, I thought, well, the, first of all, the simple fact that women and children are the most affected by climate change. You know, in, they often in, in many countries, those who are responsible for feeding, uh, for collecting water, um, and, and those simple resources are so affected by climate change. Um, there are so many other interconnected rights in other countries that are affected by climate change as well. But I think in particularly with my experience in industry, my industry is very male dominated. You know, I, I come from the construction and property industry. It's very alpha and, and it, you know, it's great industry to work in. It's very vibrant. There's a lot happening, but there's a very, um, the conversation is always the same. And I find that when we get women in the room, the conversation changes and we have a different way of solving problems. So I feel like, you know, the, the climate conversations that we've been having, this is COP26, you know, there've been 25 previous COPs and yet carbon emissions are still increasing, you know, and ecological breakdown is still happening. So we really need more voices, more diversity in the conversations to help us tackle these problems in a different way, just bringing different viewpoints in. And with that different perspective as well of, of on the ground experience, not just people, politicians and corporates sitting in closed rooms, just talking from their own experience, which is very narrow, really. So that's the why, but now how do you do that? Because like, <laughs> there is tons of way, but what is your way of doing yeah. it? Yeah, yeah. So this is a journey for me. I don't have completely have the answer, but I have the way that I've come to it. So my journey has been one of um, trying to tackle sustainable corporate activity from the inside of industry and becoming very frustrated that actually our way of trying to make businesses particularly more sustainable, more responsible, isn't working. And so my frustration just really exploded in 2019 when reports of that the Amazon were on fire, was on fire. Um, we had some amazing natural world documentaries on the BBC that were just exposing what was really going on with climate change and extinction. And the reports from the IPCC, the, the 1.5 degree report came out. And I, I really understood that I was on the inside of this problem. I was part of the problem because I was not, I, I was tackling it in this old way that really wasn't working. So then I shifted into more of an activist mindset to get out on the street, to express that frustration, to demand change. And I think it's such, you know, street activism of rising up and saying no, you know, no more is such a powerful tool. I really want to encourage as many people as possible to, to, to use their power, use their voice and rise up and say, we see what's happening. And even if we don't have the solutions, we demand that you find the solutions, that you do better and that you stop doing what you've always done. So certainly I think that street activism is so important um, to give everybody a voice. And then within the corporate world as well, you know, I have a lot of, um, I do a lot of work with businesses to really change mindsets about how we approach corporate ESG, you know, environmental social governance practices. This is 
this language, corporate sustainability, corporate ESG, what it's creating is something that is other from the rest of the business. So you have your, your business here, your normal business going about uh, its day, and then you have ESG over here. And it, the two things are separate. We need them to come together. So I work with businesses to try and bring that into the core of the business. Can you, can you give an example maybe mm. of how you manage to bring that together? Or? Yeah, yeah. So one of the amazing tools that I use is the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. Now, a lot of businesses are aware of these goals and they talk about them a lot in their marketing materials about how they're working to reduce poverty and how they're working with clean energy but they're still looking at them as something external to their business. What I do with businesses is I bring that in and say, this is not something separate from your business. This is your business. So economic growth, jobs, you know, the way you pay people, the way you buy your products and services, the way you communicate with your staff and your communities, it's all in there. So throw away the sustainability plan and write your business plan based on the sustainable development goals. And instead of having a human resources department and an accounts department and a health and safety department as well and a sustainability department make people's jobs solution focused outcome focused so my job is clean energy that's my job or my job is no poverty or better nutrition and get people across the businesses collaborating. So if I work in accounts, or if the solution is no poverty as one of the SDGs, that requires people from your accounts department to pay people on time. It requires you to pay a living wage to your staff. It requires you to put in place education for people with their finances so that they can enjoy better mental health. And you get this connectedness then across the business. And you also, the benefit of that as well. So many people are depressed at work. You know, there's a real mental health crisis and a, a separation for people um, with what they do for a living and then what they really value in their lives. The way to, I think, tackle that in the corporate world is to give people purpose. Being in accounts isn't a purpose, it's just a job. Dealing with poverty and eradicating poverty is a purpose. And if you give that to people as part of their job, I think they then get a joy from doing that and they will explore the options. They'll become quite creative in how they can tackle that problem. And I think that's a great way of driving ownership as well within the business. So this is not just the sustainability manager's job, it's everybody's job. So you mean what you said in the end is that even in your job, you can be empowered to fight against the climate crisis? Absolutely. And all of those goals are connected to the climate crisis because it means we, the world is just out of balance. You know, all we're thinking about is money. And so, you know, society, justice, our resources, you know, the atmosphere, everything else is being affected for this pursuit for money. But money is not a purpose. It doesn't really bring people joy. You know, bringing in those things has an inherent benefit to society, to the environment, and of course, the climate. And now I'd like to, you to talk a little bit of the court case that you're leading, because yeah. I think like we talk now about how you can be on board in your job, but you are leading a court case against the UK government, if yes. I understand correctly. Yeah. And that's another tool of activism and yeah. like, yeah, I'd yeah. love you to talk about that. So, this was a, this has been a really interesting journey for me. I'm not a lawyer. I, I've never been involved in legal action before. Um, but I had been campaigning locally with an amazing group in North London um, who's fighting the um, construction of a new waste incinerator in Edmonton in North London. And I'd been working with them for, for two years and we really weren't getting anywhere. All of our local politicians and the, the waste authority were just brushing us away and they were um, just ignoring our complaints and ignoring our protests and we were getting so frustrated and I, I felt like I could do something more you know and especially with my the privilege I have of my education and my networks um, I sort of I, I started investigating what impact what bigger impact I could have and um, 
I realized that actually the incinerator locally, although I think it's environmentally damaging and it's not the right thing to do, they're not doing anything illegal. They are actually just operating within the policies of the country, of, of the UK. So I decided what I actually had to do was take the fight to the government because the government was putting in place policies that were not aligned with the Paris Agreement. And that meant that waste incinerators are being built. So I met a legal team, which is a story in itself, but they had previously represented one of our fellow campaigners. And um, I, uh, I started working with them on the reasons why incineration was happening. Um, and we... Uh, we then saw part of the problem was that carbon is not taxed properly in the UK. It's not taxed properly anywhere in the world. What we really need is a great carbon tax. But to bring a legal action, we needed something um, in the UK that we could focus on, which was the new emissions trading scheme. So anyway, that it, there's a very lot of detail in this. You know, you, you realize when you do legal action, it just turns into this very complicated thing very quickly. But essentially, I uh, brought a legal action, a challenge against the, the UK government to say, the policy that you have in place for emissions trading is illegal because it does not comply with the Paris Agreement or the UK's Climate Change Act. And yeah, we were in the High Court in March uh, earlier this year, and it was amazing. You know, see, it makes me feel very grown up to have my name. You know, it was um, Elliot Smith versus the Secretary of State for Business, Energy, and Industrial Strategy. You know, and to see that on legal papers just made me go, "Oh my goodness!" Um, the whole thing was crowdfunded. My lawyers were amazing. They're the same lawyers who challenged the Heathrow Airport expansion. Um, so they were very uh, practiced in climate cases. And we worked together for the last year um, and ended up in the High Court uh, in March. We did, unfortunately, we lost the case. But what I realized about climate law is it's so new. What we need is a lot of cases so that we can build the precedent, we can build case law. And even though the judge decided overall that the Secretary of State had discretion in this matter, so it wasn't for the courts to decide, what he did say in his judgment was that the Paris Agreement demands urgent short-term action and that the government cannot rely on net zero by 2050. Um, it's too far away. It, they must act in the short term. Now, that's the first time that a judge in an English court has ever said that. So now other climate cases are using that statement to build their case on. So that's that. this is such a beautiful thing about climate litigation, is that even whether you win the case or not, every step is a step towards climate justice. And we're making progress bit by bit. And so I love it. It's been great. So you, you do believe that legal action is also a way to, to make our case? A hundred percent. I really feel strongly now that our governments are so practiced now in um, saying the right words and making all of these statements and these promises and they almost, I feel like they don't really care whether it's true or not. You know, the, 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 the words, you know, the blah, blah, blah. It, it, we're all so tired of hearing that now. We don't need any more words. We don't need any more targets. We need action. And I feel like when we're campaigning, often we get these statements that are just pushing you away and ignoring the problem and saying, it's fine, it's fine. When you start legal action, they have to show up, they have to respond, they have to provide evidence. And even in the arguments that they construct in defense, there are things in that that expose the real reason behind the policy. And so I feel like through the legal action, you get under the skin of government and policy. And I also think it's a very important process to show our civil servants, to show our ministers that we are watching and they cannot get away with poor policy or 
you know, misaligned policies now. We're watching, and if they are not really careful and ambitious, we're going to come after them. So they need to get it right, and they need to really pay attention. I agree. <laughs> I, there is. I, I have a question, though. It's like we see that I think overall the world that court case for climate justice are really increasing in France, in the Netherlands, in Germany, yes. like at the like the children courts as well. Yeah. Um, but it's still a um, new way for activists. So it's still like a minority of activists, yes. with activists who are already a minority. So mm -hmm. how do you bring other people on board on this, in this journey of, we, we are suing the UK government and, and that's why, and come join us. Like, yeah. Because it's, it's huge. Yeah. So. Well, it's been, you know, taking this legal action, although it's been exhausting, you know, and it has taken up a huge amount of time and energy, emotional energy as well. but. Also, it's been so enriching because people have contacted me from all over the world. I had the most incredible experience. So I, I've, I'm not wealthy. I'm not a wealthy person, but I've, um, so I've had to crowdfund all of my legal fees. And I have had the most amazing people. There was a woman called Lucy that I met. Um, I didn't meet her until uh, after I saw on my crowdfunding page these messages saying, happy birthday, Lucy. I thought, who is that? And then I realized it was just an, an activist that I had been speaking to on Zoom occasionally. She had asked her family and friends for her birthday gift to donate money to my crowdfunding campaign. And that sort of thing happened to me a lot. Complete strangers would support me and get behind me and be promoting this and sharing it. and. It was so wonderful because it, I think there are a lot of people who are frustrated, who feel that they just don't know what to do. And when somebody takes action to, to then, you know, build that up and come together and, and work together on that is such a lovely community feeling. And I've been so enriched by the incredible support I've had from people that I know, I, I, and I, I completely understand, I'm in such a privileged position. I mean, here I am in a country where I have legal rights. You know, I'm a woman in business. I, although I'm not wealthy by Western standards, I live a very comfortable life. You know, I'm an educated middle-class white woman. So I have a position of privilege, and I, I feel like this is a great way for me to use that privilege and hopefully inspire other people who may be in the same position to use their privileges too to to use that to do something meaningful you know and bring people together and i hope it inspires people because i, I never thought i would become a legal activist but i found it just amazing and i really want <laughs> i really i love that loads of people around the world are starting to do this you know because it feels to me like such a great thing such a great movement did you like? Did you have the idea of suing the UK government just out of the blue, or did have you like take example from other countries, or just and then um, you realize that others were doing it like by chains? Yeah. You know, I don't think I can. I can't pinpoint any particular case that inspired me, but I've. I think I'd heard about it. You know, I'd heard about people starting to take action, and within my network of other women taking action you know we've got amazing people like Jojo Mata who is you know who is um, head of the uh, Stop Ecocide Foundation you know and is trying to get ecocide in it as a, a punishable crime in The Hague you know and these amazing movements to hold governments to account you know and I, I've when I met this legal team who had represented this friend of mine um, on a local matter against an incinerator, when I started speaking to them, it was really then that the opportunities opened up, you know, and I, I think it, because they had also represented activists, friends of the earth, in their action against uh, Heathrow Airport expansion, I knew that this was something that you could do, you know, and I didn't realize it was something you could do as an individual. I thought you had to be like Greenpeace or Friends of the Earth or a big organization. But yeah, you can bring this action as, a, as an individual. You don't have to be part of a big group. Um, 
There is one thing, you do need to have credibility in the, the subject matter. So when, this is the way in the UK courts, when you bring a case, you have to show that you are in some way connected to that. So demonstrating that you have been campaigning against it for some time or you're in some way an expert in that field or not even an expert, but in some way you have a um, connection to it. I think the interesting thing though about climate and environmental issues is we all have that connection. These things are about our shared heritage, about our shared future, you know, and and so I don't think anybody should feel like it's only if you're an engineer or a scientist or a, you know, the, the CEO of a, a big NGO organization, any citizen can do this. That's a good transition for my last question. Do you have any concrete advice for women, youth, minorities to start their activist journey? Yeah. Um, oh gosh, so much. <laughs> so much. Um, you know, it, it's interesting, isn't it? I think I was on a, a panel, yes, I, well I moderated a panel yesterday about activism and, and drew amazing activists, female activists from around the world who are working in lots of different areas, you know, like working in, in government, at their politicians or their lawyers or their work for NGOs or their activists, you know, like youth activists um, and many others. And I think what defines all of them is they just, or what, what connects all of them is that whatever field they're working in, whatever community they're from, they are just, they want to see change. You know, they really want change and they act. You know, and the thing about being an activist is you do have to act. And I think there's, there's a point at which you come out from behind your screen and out from behind the conversations and making that transition, transition into action, it's very hard on your own. You know, sometimes people say to me, what should an individual do? And I think the response to that is stop being an individual because actually what we all need in order to make that transition from just talking about it into action is to come together in groups to support each other find your people and help each other into action come up you know co-create solutions that may be going on a march it may be a protest it may be um confronting a particular brand or it may be taking the government to court or it could be anything you know changing our buying habits or whatever it is the the big step for a lot of people is actually going along to a protest and quite a few people have come up to me and said you know oh, I really love Extinction Rebellion or I love Insulate Britain or I love Fridays for Future but I don't I've never been to one and I don't know what it's going to be like and I don't know if I have to be if I've got to really know about the environment in order to go and be an expert no just go you know I, the first time i ever went to a protest i was like this corporate person i'm an engineer you know it's really not like me but i went along and there was something when you go you, you see so many different people and you realize what connects you is your humanity you know you don't you don't need to understand the solution you don't need to have the solution to be an activist i think governments corporates even your family people who say okay it's fine protesting but what's the answer just say to them i don't need to have the answer i just need to stand up and i need to tell the people in power that they need to get the right experts working on the right solutions because governments pay big consultancies millions and millions of dollars to give them advice they're the experts they just need the right brief government needs to give them the right brief with the right purpose and the right intention and the right policies for them to find the solution it's up to us to demand that they do better so don't be put off by people who tell you that you need to have the answers and the solutions tell them go and ask the scientists go and ask the experts i'm here to tell you to go and do that yeah thank you, thank you.